Boom, there we go. Thank you, Frank, for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Awesome, man. So I got to start with uh, the first question. I've been doing this a lot lately. What's your favorite superhero and why? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there is one uh, in my line. I, I, I would look for some sort of Earth hero. And uh, maybe there is one, but I haven't seen them yet. So, yeah, I don't know. It does, you know, that's very interesting. It maybe Groot, just because Groot is, uh, he literally is a tree and he is constantly growing. But, oh, nice. Okay. I don't well, know. Well, maybe we can get him to run for public office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only the problem is all he says is, I am Groot. You just have to interpret what it means. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> so, but that's awesome. Um, so, okay, then we got to dive into that. So the earth reclaiming nature, who you are, exuberant animals, where did this story begin? Right. Well, it, it depends how far back you want to go. But my, my personal life, I had a pretty conventional upbringing with, uh, with sports and whatnot. I played water polo in high school, and I was really excited about that. And then I, I moved into martial arts and into rock climbing, which mm. both just turned me on incredibly. So, so I really liked the athletic side of things. But um, when I was at Stanford, my, one of my professors in human biology was talking about human evolution and said that if you really want to understand where you came from and what your body is all about, you have to go to Africa. And so I actually did that in the year 2000. And that really opened my eyes up to my ancestry, my heritage, and the challenge of what it would have been like to actually make a living out in a natural habitat. And then, of course, growing up in California, I had a, a very big uh, environmental influence in my life. And so it's all coming together. I'm trying to make it all into one circle, one whole. And that, that's my life. So is that where you got the concept of uh, Ubuntu, or how do you pronounce it? Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Yes, that that's from uh, uh, African heritage, and it simply is a social identity philosophy that is really common in Southern Africa, and it's the idea that our identity comes from tribe, not from the individual so much. Uh, I am who I am because of who we are. Yeah. That is, that's in radical contrast to what we see in American culture where it's all about your resume and your individual performance. Yeah. And so, it pulls out altruism in a different light. See, net, since reading it um, on your site, I've been trying to approach things and think about them a lot differently because that method of understanding the self as a collective should change a lot. And I actually just read an article recently on multiple personality disorder may be a show of the universal consciousness of people. Because if there's quite literally multiple personalities in someone, who's not to say that they are different actual uh, representations of who someone was. right right and Carl Jung would have said that well that's an expression of the the collective unconscious because we we do share so much and it's um, our bodies are continuous not just with habitat but with tribe so it makes sense that we would have different voices that play out in our lives yeah yeah, yeah it's like um, I know a lot of people say when a conversation is going on, you have both your brain talking. So you have two voices in your head figuring out what the two voices in the other head, person's head is figuring out. And then those voices are creating completely different voices in the center. And it's, I mean, it becomes a whole, like, if you think that what you see and who someone is, is only what is on the surface, then you're, you're sorely mistaken. Right, right. The body is vast. Habitat is vast. And tribe is vast as well. Exactly. So you go study in Africa. How long was that for? It, not long. I, I went on safari and I was lucky enough to go out with a tribe of Hadza Bushmen and went on a hunt with them. And it was, it was a real eye opener. They actually um, killed a monkey during that time and they, they cooked it on a fire and I got to hang out with that whole scene. So it was really exciting. I went back um, several times and it, 
I wasn't a researcher. I wasn't in an academic um, context, but I was still able to see a lot, and the, the memories just keep coming back to me all the time. That is awesome. So then you come back, and when did you then start Exuberant Animal and creating this this mindset of becoming one with nature again and, and just being – you know, happy and living. Together. Right. Well, that, that was about the same time. So I went in the year 2000. That was my first trip there. And then I started riding shortly thereafter. And like I say, it's all about trying to, to make it whole, whatever it is we're doing, try and make it whole. Yeah. And for a long time, I used my martial art background and some of the games that I invented, this idea of play-based fitness and using that in our movement classes, that was a big part of it. But then also the, the scholarship side of things, learning about human history, learning about habitat, and trying to integrate our, our bodies into that, that world. So, uh, yeah, it's just been a process of, of putting things together. Totally. So are you then someone who views the world as a kind of a puzzle and you're constantly seeing the pieces and you don't know where they're going to fit, but at a certain point you're like, that's, that's why I learned that one thing. Right, right. That would be a good way to put it for sure. Yeah. I, I just follow, follow my interests and, and have confidence that eventually I'm going to be able to fit that into the whole yeah. And, and it usually works out that way. Yeah. Awesome. So then the new book coming out, uh, what is this going to be? What are you going to give to the world? Right. Well, again, this is a, an idea about how to make it whole, mm -hmm. make our experience whole. The book is called The New Old Way. And just like it sounds, I'm trying to take our prehistorical uh, culture and legacy and put it together with a new way and see if I can't make a synthesis of those two. And I'm, I'm not the first person to try and do this. So this idea of uh, taking the best of both worlds, the best yeah. of the old and the best of the new, trying to put them together because they don't work um, as standalone ideas. Yeah. You know, the old stuff is wonderful, but we can't go back to living in the bush. I mean, that's, that's just not going to work. But, and the new stuff is powerful, but incredibly dangerous, too. Mm -hmm. So I think that the two working together can make a, a, make a whole that makes us healthier and happier. I love that. So, like, basically one foot in what is going on now, the science, the technology, the craziness, and right. another foot in, like – who we were, what we are, and the connection. I, I, I've heard this a lot, but I think a lot of people separate the environment and us. And yes. we are the organism inside of the environment. I mean, we are the environment as well. And we don't right. like that. Right. And in paleo cultures, they didn't make that distinction. For them, there was no outside world. There was no environment. They, they were continuous with the environment. And what's exciting for me is that you hear that in paleo cultures, indigenous cultures around the world, but then now we, we're starting to have modern science come to that same conclusion where the, the buzzword of the day now is interdependence, yes. interrelationship. And a lot of these modern scientists are, are saying, yeah, that's exactly how the world works. Seriously. I mean, like people will take um, like the Mediterranean diet, for instance. I was talking to Brad Pilon and he was like, you know, it's not the Mediterranean diet that is the reason it works. It's the Mediterranean lifestyle. It's the way of living. It's the air. It's literally how they built their house so that CO2 and O2 can go in and out easily. Like there's mm -hmm. so many factors that we're like, nah, it's the, it's the olives. The olives. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and this goes back to the whole – uh, I give nutritionism and it goes back to the discovery of, of scurvy and vitamin C and these, you know, these uh, elements within the food that have these magical properties. And yes, sometimes they do, but we break things apart, we reduce them and then we run into trouble. Yeah. That's like, um, I can't remember the book's name right now, but where he goes and he's uh, asking them how they, uh, they figured out DMT by mixing, or not DMT, uh, ayahuasca, by mixing together the two plants, the native tribe. I forget the book's name. And they're like, the plant showed us how to do it. 
Right. <laughs> like, but where did that start? How did that start? And then it comes to be that one of the plants is just one of 14 different types of paralytics that now they use as modern anesthetics as well. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, or aloe the other day, uh, my girlfriend got burnt and she's like, Oh, I need the aloe. And I'm like, this is an amazing plant. Like people don't even realize that I could just go to the store and buy aloe. It's like, like think about the properties in these plants and this environment around us where basically everything can be used and cooperates together. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It is a, uh, it's a phenomenal thing. So now if you check out exuberant animal, you'll see some awesome looking exuberant animal type movements and behaviors. And what is the, the methodology, the mindset behind like actually going, moving your body in weird ways, using Ubuntu and like getting back into that movement? Right. Well, one thing I start people with is making a distinction between exercise and movement. Mm. And I think this is key because we've in the modern world, we've come to this belief that exercise is the vital component. But if you look at big picture, you don't see non-human animals exercising. And if you even look at recent human history, there was no such thing as exercise mm -hmm. before like maybe the 19th century. Um, even something like yoga, that was not considered exercise. That was a discipline. So exercise is this brand new modern invention, and it's something that we could easily do without uh, as long as we get the movement. The movement is the essential thing, and the movement, that's a broader category. That includes everything that we do that that moves our bodies. It could be blue collar labor, it could be gardening, it could be play, it could be sex, it could be any number of things. So I say, let's forget about exercise yeah. and let's get some movement. And again, coming from my martial art background, we had a lot of movements where it would involve touching other people, moving other bodies around in space, and especially doing three dimensional movement getting out of the, the sagittal plane, getting more into the frontal plane and the transverse plane. Those dancer-like movements can be really fun and really therapeutic as well. So then how would you have someone start to play around with movement and learn about their own body and what makes them feel good? Right. Well, if it's a brand new beginner, and there's a lot of them out there, we start with basic stuff. We, we, we build it from the ground up with locomotion. So I get people with their shoes off. I get people out on the grass and, and moving around, hopping, skipping, jumping, doing step and stop movements, um, which is just simply taking a big step and sticking the land in. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing, those fundamentals get missed because in, in physical education classes in, in the modern world, we go directly to sports and yeah. we bypass the actual physical education. <laughs> so that's where I start. And the beauty of that is we can have fun and we can learn the fundamentals at the same time. Totally. And with, with sports, see, I'm, I know a lot of people don't like this, but I'm kind of against sports in a lot of ways, at least traditional yeah. sports, because not only are they so illogical in the way that you move, the what you do, where you're, I mean, essentially it's gladiators, right? It all stems from these Olympic <laughs> games and right. let's go and hurt ourselves and do, and the reason I think people do it is for the Ubuntu type, like feel is like, we are a collective consciousness moving against this other thing and it's us together embarking on something and then people right. are like, that's my exercise that's no you're wearing a cast on your feet you're doing all these things so wrong and i think when we get pushed to that at the beginning it creates an identity of like i'm the sports guy yeah yeah exactly and it's it's tricky i i always get back to this phrase the dose makes the poison mm -hmm. so a little bit of sporting experience I think is really great for people and I, I encourage people to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you get too absorbed in it, then it becomes counterproductive after a while and you get your overuse injuries and then you get the narcissism too that comes in with focusing so heavily on your sporting performance and then the, yes. the, the returns start to diminish and you're no longer whole, you're no longer round. So 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, anything, any stick sport, right? Hockey, golf, tennis, one side, you're training one side and it just keeps going. And then of course they get older and they're like, Oh, this one side, it's so bad. And it's like, yeah, because every day you swung the club 10,000 times with one arm, with one direction. And I, 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 to me, it just doesn't make that much sense. I also am not someone who likes to uh, watch something if I can't do it. Right, right. It's Same like, idea. I want to do something. Tuesdays with Maury was uh, – I read that a long time ago in high school. And it's like this old man who's like, go out there and, and do something. And he's like on his deathbed. He's like, stop watching TV. If you want to do that sport, go play it. And like right. that, I'm like, oh, I can't. I can't just be in the mindset of like, I'm going to watch it for six hours. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's gotta be a doing. Absolutely. Which brings up another phrase I use with people all the time is experience is the language of the body. And that goes deep because the body, when we're born, we don't know what kind of habitat we're going to be involved in. And so we, we need to have experience to teach us how to adapt. And th- th- there's, no, there's no formula beyond that. I mean, the, the habitat is our teacher and the habitat is, is our physician in a lot of ways too. And that experience that we have is what shapes our bodies. So I always put the experience there or the, the emphasis there on experience. Totally. So your basics are go have someone – Stand outside, barefoot, yes. start to ground, get some ground, and get some experience back in nature where they should be. Right. Move. Just explore. <laughs> yeah, and then there, there's a lot of specific games that we do, but um, the principles are, are, are all there, and we do very little in the way of competition. Um, it's mostly uh, mostly educational and, and fun. Awesome. So with the new old way then – what is kind of the mindset and the all encompassing um, human that, that you're kind of seeing and and drawing upon conclusions through the book? Like the ultimate human, the essential human. We, the human that is fulfilled, happy can move and laugh. Right. Be themselves. Well, the, 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 for the human to be complete, mm-hmm. there's got to be, of course, their own individual health. And there, there's, there's so much we hear about that. And that, that's familiar territory. But for the, the human to be complete, there's got to be some grounding in habitat and in tribe. And without those two elements, the, it, it's, it's never complete. And the, the thing that concerns me the most is this divorce we have from habitat now where we just parachute in now to various habitats and everybody uh in the modern world has has moved several times in their life and we we typically go to places where we can afford to live not not based on the the plants or the animals Mm -hmm. and so we parachute into these habitats and most of us know very little about what's actually going on on the ground in our habitats and that's that's a real barrier to being whole, I think. Totally. And then, so then with tribe, and I was talking to um, David Burke, who studies kind of network, uh, networks and uh, social collective. Right. Uh, he was talking about, and I think this follows along the lines of what you were just saying, where you go to where you afford. Same goes with school and everybody goes to school and they're just put there with people. And these people aren't necessarily their tribe or who they want their tribe to be, but they become influenced by the people around them. Would you say that it makes sense to go and pursue a tribe that you want to be a part of, or does the tribe organically come around you? Well, the thing you got to understand is our culture is in many ways Mm anti-tribal because we are so competitive and we start the school starts the competition right from the word go. I mean, your classmates yeah. are your competitors and that is, I think really dangerous. The other thing that has to happen is people need to slow down and, and keep 
get their bodies involved in conversation with people. Mm. All this electronic stuff now, I think it, it can facilitate communication, but it doesn't really uh, facilitate conversation yes. need to have the body involved and that takes time and you know, if you don't take the time you're not going to build up tribal relationships so it, you know you make your choice with who you hang out with but even then you've got to slow down and yeah. do that then it's going to become more meaningful awesome yeah i think it's i think if people could it's starting to build that again, like group interaction. And like, I know there's like some subdivisions and places where it's like, everybody knows each other, but it's still pretty like isolated. They don't like do things together. And you're still like, I wonder what the neighbor's doing. And you feel influenced by that. And it's such a, it's so shallow and it's so just not a real person. Right. And the, the, the other part of the, the, the cultural challenge there is just the fact that so many of our relationships now are transactional, mm -hmm. which means we are constantly buying and selling from each other. And you go out in a typical day and most of the people that you interact with are buying or selling something to you or from you. And those transactional encounters are historically abnormal. I mean, you wouldn't do that with people normally. Yeah. This whole idea of commerce is new and pretty abnormal. So it, once you take that into account, you really have to work hard to have authentic, normal human relationships. Seriously. I mean, we're, we're all labeled now as a, a consumer. Right. And I think that mindset is not good. It's not yes. consumers versus sellers. <laughs> right, right. And somehow we need to have an idea of big Ubuntu where you know, all humans are part of the same tribe. All humans, all life on earth comes from the same ancestor. So really we're all in the same lifeboat. And those kind of ideas, those circular round ideas, yeah. can maybe overcome some of this polarization that we have now. Yeah, that's that whole, um, I saw the theory. It's like, hopefully aliens, like we figure out they're real because then it will be an us versus them thing. Except <laughs> right. all humans. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, if that's what we need, I think it should be like a us, you know, just us, you know, with the earth. Yes. Have you run into uh, this book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and that's, you know, he starts the book out as a, as a young man and wishing for some sort of natural disaster that would bring together the people in his community. Yeah. And I, I really share that sentiment. I, I can really understand that because as it is right now, we're just all scattered over the world, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just like, you know, it's hard because um, I feel like time is a facilitator of in-depth analysis into things. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's uh, something like the quality of coffee, which coffee keeps like now it's a crazy field and you can get super deep into it. But just about with anything, um, the human psyche is one of those things that the more time that goes on, the more people are thinking about these, uh, these things, these messages created by marketing and other uh, slogans that it's like, you're not good enough here. You're not good enough there. Like use this, wear lipstick because it's something that makes your lips red, which then signifies that, oh, you're actually into a sexual behavior or something. You're aroused in some way or another. And we don't realize all these, these things that are being put into our heads and then mm -hmm. we get more into our heads and then we're so in our heads. And I know I've been there before where it's, um, my thoughts are so loud. I don't even know what's going on outside. <laughs> right. And that's what I think. I think there's a, there's a common, uh, let's say mental virus that's going on just like that right now. Right. Well, you know, uh, I don't know if you've tracked this group called Adbusters, Adbusters mm -hmm. magazine. Well, they're, they're sort of a renegade group of advertising people. And one of their, their, uh, they call it subvertising. One of their, um, ad campaigns is to have a poster and it just has two columns and at the top of one it says name these brands and they have some corporate logos mm -hmm. and then over on the other side name these plants and it shows different kinds of plants and then the 
obvious message is that almost everybody in the modern world would be able to name the brands. Oh, there's Apple, there's Nike, and so on. But yeah. over here on the other column, name these plants, almost nobody could do it. So oh, wow. that shows how far we've come in this um, sort of hypnotic corporate environment. Yeah. And it's that, yeah. and um, I mean, even in corporate though, it's, it's, see, that's the outside. That's like, Hey, we know these brands, but the inside too, it's like the people inside the brands don't even like the other people inside the brands. <laughs> it's, it's so the whole system in that sense, in the corporate sense, in the, um, it's so flawed in almost every single way. Right. And the more, I mean, you'll have the argument like, but at a certain point, a system has to get to, and it's like, no, because it's just people creating systems. Businesses are a collective energy that people put into, they, it's a group of people putting collective energy together to create something that hopefully was supposed to be positive towards the world. And now right. it's falling apart in that direction because of money, because of value. It's a, it's a very strange thing with yes. that the concept of following your bliss. This is something that I like a lot. Um, and it goes completely against exactly what we were just talking about for the most part, unless you right. to create a corporate company and <laughs> have people all said, why did you go on this drive to exuberant animal and really, you know, is this your bliss? Is, is that exactly what you're following? Yeah, it, well, it is. It's, I guess, um, it's my curiosity mm. is what it is primarily because I was so turned on to these ideas when I was first exposed to them that I said, there has to be a connection between my desire to move my body and my history. There has to be. And when I first pitched this idea to some uh, New York uh, literary people, uh, editors and agents, that kind of thing. They said, well, no, you can't, you can't write about that because fit, you know, you're writing about fitness and that's got to be about weight loss and appearance. And if you have some other thing, well, we're not going to go for that. So I've been fighting an uphill battle for a long time, yeah. but my curiosity is so intense that I keep going with it. And, you know, it's not always blissful, but I tell you, when I put some of these ide ideas together mm -hmm. and I get my language right in my books, then it's extremely satisfying. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I would encourage people to, you know, maybe quit your day job. <laughs> maybe, yeah. you know, take some chances. May, maybe, you know, follow your curiosity and go with it because the times are changing big time now. Yeah. And that means opportunity too. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the scariest thing, if, if uh, I know Nassim Nicholas Talib, he says the three most dangerous things in the world are heroin, sugar, and a month to month paycheck. And it's <laughs> like, one of the main things is people are so reliant on, Oh, next month, my company deposits this much money into X and that keeps happening. And it, it's almost that training mechanism of positive reinforcement of cool. I just stay in the system and just things go good. And um, just like in stumbling upon happiness, when he measures happiness levels, mm -hmm. there's, you may be right here. Someone else is living up here and you could get there. But right now you think this is the happiest that there could be. And I'm not saying like chase the high, but by understanding that there is more out there that you haven't experienced yet, that that's exactly where that uncomfortable zone of getting away from the corporate, quitting your job relies. Right. Well, another way to think of it too is follow your bliss, follow your curiosity and follow your sense of meaning. That's what I think really makes the difference. Um, there's a fellow, his, his name escapes me right now, but he's done a lot of research intrinsic rewards versus extrinsic mm -hmm. rewards. And if you follow extrinsic rewards exclusively, you're going to wind up anxious and depressed. And that's, that's been pretty conclusively shown in the research. Um, there's another fellow, Alfie Kahn, K-O-H-N, mm -hmm. and he's, 
he's written a book called Punished by Rewards. And it's a very interesting book because he tracks this idea of reward giving all the way through kindergarten, from kindergarten all the way through the corporate world. And he says, we are basically trained not just uh, to get rewards, we're trained by rewards. We're, tra we're yeah. trained to get rewards in general. And that's the sort of meta message of what's going on in society right now. Just do this and you will get that. Yeah. So we become these stimulus response machines and we lose sense of our own intrinsic values and meaning. And that's really dangerous. Seriously. I, I challenge anyone who ever has one of those points where they're like, I'm not doing good. I don't have money, all this stuff to sit down, take some deep breaths, do a meditation, dance for a while, write down your thoughts and then see how you feel. Cause it's going to literally change everything about who you <laughs> think you are. Yeah. Like, that's we're we're missing the the training inside yes and it's um it's one of those things are you a huge proponent of meditation yes um and you know i've gone to some meditation retreats and i practice not intensively but mm -hmm. frequently and i think it's the it's the yin to the yang of of physical striving and movement and I, I think those two are both essential in the modern world and we can uh i could say more about how i would use those strategically yeah. um, so what i do you know most people look at meditation and and exercise movement as the kind of thing they're good things to do and they will benefit you over a long period of time so if you get involved in training program you know five years from now you're going to feel better or if you start meditating five years from now you're going to feel better but i i lately i've been looking at how these things work in just the day-to-day -day fashion mm. and then comparing against what kind of tasks you're faced with in a given day. So, for example, if you are faced with a task that is difficult and challenging, like doing your taxes, yeah, I think a good thing to do before that is some hardcore physical strength training. Lift some weights, go out for a run, something that you really apply some effort to and then come back in, get to your desk and then your, your challenge is going to feel a lot easier. Yeah. That makes sense. And a lot of us have had that experience, right? You, you struggle at, at some paper you're trying to write or an essay or whatever it is you go out for a run and you come back. It's easier. That's a good way to go with meditation. There's some really interesting research now that shows in the, in a corporate setting, that meditation is demotivating. And this was real problematic. This just came out a couple of weeks ago. People said, well, you shouldn't have your people meditate in a corporate environment because it's demotivating. <laughs> Which, of course it is, but that's the whole point. You sit down and you focus on relaxation, relinquishing your anxiety, the whole thing. And then you don't really feel so motivated to take on a new task. And that can be used strategically if you're faced with a situation where maybe equanimity is the best call for you. So maybe you're having to go out to dinner with some people that you really don't like, or you have to go to your in-laws and yeah. it's best to be peaceful during that time. So meditate before that. And you can, you can pick and choose your exercise or your meditation to fit with the challenges of your day. Awesome. There's a lot we can do there. Yeah. And so like with what you were saying with the uh, exercise helping to make something perceived uh, that was perceived very stressful or harsh easier. I know um, the mind's so interesting how it works, but if you give someone hot coffee before they meet the next person, they'll say that the person that they met was warm and joyful. And if you give them right, coffee, right. They'll the think body cognition. Coffee. Yeah. Yeah. The body's always working, you know, the, it, we we discount the body, but it's primal. It's always getting into the decisions we make. It's always getting into the uh, encounters that we have with people. So yeah, and it's one of the. I mean, like um, when I was starting to really get into yoga, I do hatha yoga. Um, mm -hmm. I would get into it, and I would notice it would take forty five minutes to ninety minutes of a session to like then start to get into my body. But 
then I could feel the differences in how I was moving through gravity a lot more and mm -hmm. how I was responding to things. And it's that self-critical, not self-critical, the, the self, um, the realizing of what you're doing and the way that you're acting towards things and what your mm -hmm. body feels that we need to get back to because it is a compass. We are compasses in a yep. sense. Yeah, and the, the problem, you know, there's so much hand wringing in the modern world now about these lifestyle diseases, obesity, diabetes, and all, all the rest. And that, that's true. That's a valid concern. But below all that is this physical apathy and this physical ignorance that people have now. I mean, people don't know their bodies very well at all. Yeah. And that, that's an epidemic. That's a catastrophe. That's a tragedy in its own right. And nobody's talking about that. I mean, even if we had a pill that cured obesity and diabetes and all the rest tomorrow, we would still have this lingering yep. underlying problem of physical apathy. And that's something we need to be talking about. Yeah. I can't tell how many people I know who are like, Oh, my feet hurt in these shoes or something like that. And it's like, you, you know, your feet are part of your body. Like, that is <laughs> it's very hard to um there's there's so many people who almost like they they are not their body in a sense mm -hmm. absolutely their, their lower extremities are like you're like i don't know they're it's just my legs they're just hanging out over there right right yeah it's uh it's a question of identity as well mm -hmm. and this all gets back to the philosopher rene descartes he was the guy who came up with this idea of this mind-body dualism, and his, his idea was that he didn't even trust his own body. He said, well, there could be evil demons that are piping this false sensation into my brain, and how would I ever know that? So therefore, I'm just going to identify with my mind and, and not with my body. Yep. And that was a real crazy idea. It was important for science, and yeah, I get why that was you know, pivotal. But it was also terrible for um, for our physical knowledge of yeah. ourselves. Oh, I would agree. I've uh, I've played with the concept of that dualism for a long time because it's so. In in one way, I think I like it in the sense of the mind. There's a mind external from the body that has the ability to influence, and they both work together. Mm -hmm. In the other sense, it takes away who you are from who you actually are. Because even if there was a mind separate from your body now, you are now your body. So until you're just that mind, you don't have the ability to just be the mind. Because if you get sick, this is something I was saying the other day because I was nauseous in an Uber. I was like, when you're nauseous, that's literally all you can focus on. And that's your body. It's really hard to go... No, it's just a, it's just your body making up an impulse. It's like, no, you're, you're nauseous. It's the worst thing. You want to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, well, I've noticed the same thing, too, with, with different kinds of physical activity. So if I go out for a run and I'm running uphill, the ideas that I have while I'm running uphill are totally different than the ones when I'm running downhill. Yeah. And I, there's just a powerful relationship there. Yeah, I get, um, I do, so normally I'll do 45 minutes to an hour workout and then I'll do the sauna and then I'll do the cold shower and the cold shower, best ideas. Like at the very end when I'm almost like, uh, what my buddy says is Russian, a Russian torture method. Um, that's when I get the best ideas and I'm like, Oh yes. Okay. I got to write it. <laughs> Cause it's, it's like all those different state changes. Your body's like, everything is like what is going on you know you have bdnf just going crazy right. in your brain from the sauna and now the cold thermogenesis is like waking you up and it's like okay what do we get we got to do something to figure something out so here we go yeah yeah i love the the state change so how would you recommend fitting nature and this exuberant animal lifestyle into a modern life for people who are in a city or in a place where it's more difficult for them to just uproot and move to. Cause I'm typically on board of like, if you really want to live your best life, like you may have to leave, you may have to go somewhere else and do it. But if you have to stay where you are now, how would you incorporate these types of 
ideas and movement into a modern life? Yeah, well, there's obviously some huge obstacles there because so many people live so far away from anything resembling a natural environment. I mean, even when I lived in Seattle, it was two hours of driving to get to a good trail for me to hike on. So yes, again, quit your day job if you can do it. But um, other than that, you've got to engage your imagination and know what's normal and know what's not historically. And then to just pay attention to when you're being seduced by the modern world, because it's so easy to be seduced by air conditioning and the heat in the winter time and the easy fast food and all of these things, you have to be steadfast Mm -hmm. in fighting some of that stuff to get outside when conditions aren't ideal and to use the parks and to go up and down the stairs and that sort of thing. And, you know, find a climbing gym, do something that resembles your, your natural heritage. And yeah. it's, it's more work, you know, it's more work if you live in an urban setting, but um, you got to do it. Yeah. It's so it's, it's more work until you realize you feel better, you're happier, right. life's better. And then you're like, wow, before it was way more, it feels like it's more work and more draining in the corporate life after you put in the fr- upfront work to arrange your life to be more like the natural life. Right, right. A- another tip, I guess you'd say, is to start hanging out with people who, uh, who are going to live the way you want to live. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a really important choice. I mean, you hang out with the wrong crowd who are doing, you know, just indoor domesticated stuff all the time. That's yep. the way you're going to end up living. So, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> I would say that's one of the biggest problems is uh, and um, the David Burke was talking about. You're not only influenced by your friends, but it's uh, three or four degrees of separation. So your yeah, friends are friends of friends. Yes. And that is so hard, especially being in a city or somewhere like where it's very outside of nature, that nothing is that natural element. You do have to work to find the people, but you can find them. And there are circles. I mean, there's 8 billion people. And if you think you can't find <laughs> 10, right. 20, like you're not looking or you don't care that much. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a strange thing. So, I always ask this question: It's uh, what is your highest leverage skill that you think has helped you um, along the way to get to where you are? And so that can be anything that you learn from any sort of domain or skill that then applies to other skills. For instance, uh, learning to learn, learning how to breathe better, because then most physical activities, life, sex, spirituality, all works better but it's some type of either mindset or skill that has helped you and can help you in uh, multiple different domains. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's go back to Joseph Campbell, Mm -hmm. who was the one who coined this phrase, follow your bliss. It's really interesting because he, he put that out in the world and a lot of people picked up on it. And years later he said, you know, I I think maybe I didn't get that quite right. I think I should have said, follow your blisters. And the idea, his idea was there's real value in staying engaged and doing the work and really staying in contact with the stuff that, um, that turns you on. So it's not just a hedonistic bliss. It's, yeah. it's work. I mean, work works. And that's what's worked for me is the discipline, you know, writing is discipline and it's hard. I, I struggle with it every day, but coming back to it again and again and again, that's what, um, that's what sustains me. So yeah. follow, follow your blisters. Awesome. No, I love that. That is, yeah. I mean, it's almost that, uh, that print with anything, right? Energy, thought, intention, they all move together. So if you're not putting the energy in, why do you think you're going to get the energy out? 
Right, right. Yeah, and that's kind of a paleo thing. I mean, it, you look at all the ancient disciplines, whether it's yoga or martial arts or what have you. I mean, a big emphasis on just showing up every day and putting mm -hmm. in the time and you know respecting the discipline, that kind of thing. Yeah, that that counts for a lot. Exactly. So then, what are you currently questioning? And so this is anything. It could be the way that uh, life, society, spirituality, politics work. But it's something that you're currently right now, like, I just really don't think it works that way. But common consensus says that it does. Well, I'm really questioning this uh, cultural assumption we have of human supremacy in the biosphere. Yeah. And this is something that, I mean, this is ingrained in modern Western culture, that, that humans are the alpha animal and that Western culture is the alpha culture and we are superior to all other cultures and all other animals. I really question that. And I think that we're never going to have a good relationship with the biosphere and with the future until we, we take that head on. And I think as a culture, we have to start showing some humility and looking for integration with the natural world instead of domination over it. And that's going to be that's going to be a tough lesson, I think, for a lot of people to to swallow, because we love thinking of ourselves <laughs> as the alpha species, and um, I think that, that you know <laughs> that's a problem. That's what I mean. That's what all the science books show. It shows the human at the top of the hierarchy when you're a kid in school, and right. it's weird because I forget where I recently heard this, but it's. Uh, Oh, it was uh, in the master algorithm. He's talking about the makeup of AI and how you can just make things that uh, replicate hierarchical structures. And he was like human house. Like he said all these different things. And I was like, why is that a hierarchy? Like we have these notions of like something is above something else, but like what are you using to actually show that it's above something else? Because if it's intelligence, honestly, mushrooms are probably more intelligent than humans. <laughs> Because mushrooms are everywhere. And if you step on one, one like 100 miles away knows that you stepped on this one mushroom. Right. Transporting all the information. It looks just like a neural circuit of the brain. Right. Like, we do have these weird dissonance between what a hierarchy is and where we're living. In, like we just think because we can think we're, we're smarter than everything else. Right. Which is, you know, the ultimate human error, though, because but then we think that we're smarter than everybody else in our apartment building. Then we think we're smarter than everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're uh, we're really good at uh, promoting ourselves. It's a yeah, it's a funny human uh, human bias. It's like our blind spot. Yeah. Um, so is there anything that you're currently obsessed with? Well, I'm really interested in, in politics and activism, and I'm, you know, with the election of 2016, I redoubled my interest in all of that, yeah. and I think that we have to find a way to find uh, the common ground between health and activism. Both of these things, I think, can, uh, can increase our sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I'm really excited about because the way it stands now, we, we think of health as something that happens in the doctor's office or in the gymnasium and activism is something that happens out on the street or in the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the halls of Congress. And that separation, I think, is not serving us. I think we need to find a, a, a kind of a health activism, if you will, where we can put those two things together and leading a healthy life would would necessarily involve being active in the world yeah I, oh i would agree and i even think down to the exact dollar that you use you're either voting for or against exactly what you're saying because like we don't often think of spending money as activism but it is because if you're yeah, spending money yeah. for a company you don't like or believe their message then you're just giving in to exactly what that is right well even your lifestyle practices are um political in a sense. I mean, if you take better care of yourself, that is activism. That's pro-social, that's pro-future. And we got to put it in those terms. I yeah. think then, it, then it becomes more meaningful because if it's just about me and my body and a lot of people don't care, but no, it's like, get, 
get some sleep, eat right, take care yeah. of yourself because you will be a better activist in the world. Exactly. And the people around you will feel better because you're happier and you're bringing those yes. emotions. Yes. Everything works that way. Yeah, I'm I'm really hoping that we have some random third party win an election soon so that people who are so isolated on one side and the other side are like, wait, there's a middle. We can think about something different than just these two super animosity based political right. groups. Because like then like the people over here have kids and then they kind of breed their kids to hate the other side even more. And it's right. like, all you guys are the same people. And if I give you 10 questions, but I take out which side they are, you're almost all going to say the exact same things. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if we just say, I really want one party to come in and win and know everybody's like, what just happened? It's not a two party system anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. Big times ahead. That's yeah. Yeah, we definitely will see. But awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time, Frank. This was awesome. Um, definitely dive in. Where can people find you before we go? Right. Well, um, the new book will be out in September, awesome. maybe maybe late September. But uh, it'll be called The New Old Way. And I'll have a website, newoldway.earth. And uh, if you go to exuberanimal.com, it'll lead you in the right way. Anyhow, so uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. You bet. Glad to do it.